Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. Do you recall when Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail? So far, we have seen that that is true in the book of Acts. No matter when the gates of hell was you know, pushing back or, struck, or trying to fight back uh, the church, it could not win. Jesus wins in the end. Let me tell you, church, thank God for that. And there was a gate that was causing problems. There was a person on the other team and his name was Saul of Tarsus. And Saul tried hard to persecute and put out the flame of Christianity, but to no avail could he do that. And God does something next that no one in the church expected or saw coming. Jesus finds and singles out Saul on a road, just like the Ethiopian eunuch we learned last week, and changes his heart. Saul's life would never be the same again. And we know him maybe as Paul. And just a quick little fun fact for you, um, Jesus doesn't change his name. I think that's been taught for many years that he had a name change like Peter did from Simon to Peter. But actually Saul is his Hebrew name and Paul is his Roman name. And so when Paul went to go minister to the Gentiles in Rome or in, in other places, he would use that name because he wanted to become all things to all men so he may win some. So it wasn't that Jesus gave him a new name. He chose to use his Roman name. He was, he was a, a Jew by blood, but he was born in Tarsus, which was a Roman city and dominated city. So the rest of the book of Acts, Paul dominates the book, his life and his story. Peter and them show up again and John, but it's Paul's life. So Luke turns focus uh, from, from Acts 13 through 28 uh, Luke focuses a lot on the life of Paul and his missionary trips. And so this is an incredible story how God can change anyone. I want to encourage you as believers in this place, or maybe you are an unbeliever. And if I'm getting a little feedback, let me know there, because it sounds like I can hear a little ring or myself speak. But... Uh, if you are an unbeliever and you're kicking against God, let me tell you something. Uh, Saul's life shows you, you gotta be careful because he's gonna change your heart, okay? And as, as believers, let's not lose hope for those we're trying to believe for salvation. Okay, let's not give up. And I'm already giving away takeaways, but I just wanna just start that off. As you read this story, let your faith grow that Jesus can save anyone, amen? Let's get right into it. Acts 9 verse one. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way, the way being those who followed Jesus that he found there. So he wanted to go to Damascus and he wanted to arrest anyone who belonged to the, to the way or the people that, Jesus, that followed Jesus. And he wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. Let me show you a map because Damascus is 120 miles from Jerusalem. Now by road, 140 miles by road, uh, meaning like, you know, windy road, almost 200 miles. Okay. And so... Jerusalem is down south where Judea is and Damascus is all the way up there. I want you to see how fast the church is spreading because of the persecution of Stephen and when he was stoned and then everyone scattered and preached the gospel everywhere they went and people were saved in Jerusalem at the Pentecost uh, on, in Acts chapter two and they went back to their hometowns. He's going all the way to Damascus to hunt people down. So Saul, man, he, he's, 
he's got a problem with the way, with believers. I mean, to the point that he wants to go all the way to Damascus so that he can arrest them and sentence them to death. Okay? So remember, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Well, God sees his heart and sees what he's doing and he's got different plans for him. Verse three, it says, as he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. There's some interesting things to take from this. Usually when Jesus shows up in someone's life or an angel shows up in the Old Testament or, or Jesus himself shows up in the Old Testament, there's a light, <laughs> a bright light, and there's a voice or there's a figure there speaking. So this is a sign of a divine revelation or meeting of God and mankind. And the question, why do you persecute me is very interesting. If you persecute the church, you're persecuting Jesus too, because we are the body of Christ. So if you hurt the body of Christ, you're hurting Jesus, so to say. How you treat the body is how you're treating Jesus. That's a lesson for us too, isn't it? Not just for unbelievers. And so Jesus said, why do you persecute me? And, and you know, obviously Paul didn't realize or think that or saw, oh, by the way, can I say Paul and Saul all day? Can I do the interchangeable? Okay, great. I knew I was gonna mess up and say Paul already, you know. If, if he hurts the body, he hurts Jesus. So Jesus says, why do you persecute me? This is important because it helps us see that we really are part of Christ, that we belong to Jesus and Jesus is there for us. Amen. So when Jesus sees you hurting, he's hurting with you. He sympathizes with us. He knows what we're going through. Now in verse five, there's something really interesting. The New King James Version actually has the words, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. That's an interesting line. King James Version, New King James Version have that. It says again, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. What does that mean? Well, a goad was an instrument used by plowmen for guiding their oxen. For instance, Shamgar slew or killed 600 Philistines with an ox goad. The goad is a formidable weapon. Sometimes it was 10 feet long with a sharp point on the end of it to direct oxen or animals. And so Jesus is saying, it's hard for you to kick against me you're going to end up surrendering, in other words. You're going to be humbled. You see, what's going on here is Saul is fighting against God. Some theologians believe that he was seeing all the things that the, the church was accomplishing, and he was not just, he just didn't want to believe it. And he was fighting against what he was seeing and that he was struggling to believe and surrender. And so, it was like there was this battle. Like he sees the reality. He sees the signs and the wonders, but he doesn't care. He wants to believe what he wants to believe. How many know we, we face that too when we're evangelizing? There's people that are just not gonna change their mind. In fact, they read the Bible so they can try to come against you as a Christian. Very much like Saul. And, and Jesus is like, uh-uh-uh. And he changes his heart in this moment. He humbles him. Let's see how he does that. Let's go to verse seven. Verse seven says, the men with Saul stood speechless for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. Isn't that beautiful though? That in order for him to see spiritually, he had to be blind physically. In order for his heart to be softened, Jesus blinds him. What is this? It's a sign. It's a judgment on him. It's a temporary judgment. And it's a sign of a, an encounter with Jesus Christ. And this is, I believe, this is to humble him and to change his heart. 
Saul picked himself off the ground, discovered he was blind, so his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. How about that? How about, how about this? He's humbled so much that people have to help him get to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Theologians and scholars believe that this is where he repents. This is one of those moments where Luke doesn't mention that Paul believes in Jesus Christ. What we see next though is he gets baptized and everything, but we believe that this, this three days of humbling himself uh, or being humbled and responding to Jesus by going to the city, he obeyed Jesus, that his heart was changed and now he was repenting and ready for this, he was obeying Jesus. So in one moment, he's kicking against Jesus, fighting him. The next moment, he's listening to Jesus. That is a change of heart, my friends. Verse 10, now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. This is not the Ananias and Sapphira that passed away in Acts 5, okay? And the Lord spoke to him in a vision calling Ananias. Yes, Lord. Now vision can mean dream here as well. So he could be sleeping and had a dream, but it says a vision. So he could have been praying and the Lord spoke to him. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. That, that's kind of weird seeing those two things together. Judas, not the same Judas as the one that betrayed Jesus and Straight Street on the straight and narrow. Go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is, pre, he is praying to me right now. There you have it. His heart has changed. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I, I feel him here. I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. It's like Ananias is like, what did I eat last night? I, something's not communicating correctly here. There's no way. There is this unbelief that someone like Saul could be changed. And he's thinking, maybe I ate some bad lamb. You know, I'm, that's not true. That's not in scripture. I'm just creative licensing. Verse 15 says, but the Lord said, go for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Okay. So Paul is chosen to be the preacher to the Gentiles, which makes complete sense. God is so he is all knowing, he's so, he's, he's a genius, right? Obviously. This is, this is why I, this sticks out to me. He was born and raised in a Roman city, but he was a Jew. He would understand both. He was very dedicated, by the way, in Jewish teachings and practices while living in a non-Jewish area. And he knows both lifestyles and God would use him to reach both people. God knows what he's doing, doesn't he? It's amazing. Well, Ananias trusts the Lord on this. So verse 17, so Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, brother Saul. Wow, think about that. Brother Saul. How comforting would that be to hear for Saul? How comforting would it be for the church to welcome a person who once persecuted us and now we welcome him with loving, or her with loving arms. And we say, brother or sister, welcome home. Think about this for Saul. The Lord put this on my heart today. How, how humiliating, how, how bad would you feel after sentencing people to death or arresting people? And now you're going to the same people and you're asking them to accept you for Saul to be willing to face the people he once persecuted, it really says that he has been humbled and has changed. And just so you know, there will be people who feel the same way about you because they've treated you a certain way and they're gonna be nervous to come to you 
but let's open our hearts to believe that Christ has really changed them. Okay, now sometimes it may require that that person needs an Ananias in his or her life to help convince us as well. I get that. But let us have hearts to call people brothers or sisters. For, for Ananias to call him brother means that he was a new believer now. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. The same be filled with the Holy Spirit that they experienced at Pentecost, same language there. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength because he had been fasting for three days. He put his hands on him. He prayed for him. He was healed. A substance from his eyes fell off. And then he's, he says, so you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke doesn't give us details of his experience of that, but he, he was. And then he regains his sight. He gets up and he's water baptized. And then he eats. There is his confirmation, so to say, that he is a believer by being water baptized into the family of God. Saul had been motivated by zeal to persecute believers, but now he's gonna need more than zeal to fulfill his prophetic task of preaching the gospel to Gentiles and everyone else. He must be filled with the Holy Spirit just as the disciples were on the day of Pentecost. This is so true. I have found that's not by might, come on now, not by power, but by my spirit, by his spirit, says the Lord. It's by the Holy Spirit that we can do what we need to do. Eventually your energy and your zeal is gonna run out. And when you run out, guess who's still there? The Holy Spirit. When you have begun to quit praying for someone's salvation because it's hard, you've been praying for years and it's just, it's just you, you start to lose doubt. Guess who's there to encourage you to keep praying? The Holy Spirit. When you've run out of ideas of what to say or what to teach and, and whatever tactics we can come up with or acts of good deeds to, to help change someone's heart and it's not working, the Holy Spirit is there to help you. Luke is trying to show us that the church needs the Holy Spirit to help us. So I just wanna encourage you one more time as we go through this book to seek the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, all right? Ask him to fill you, ask him to help you because when you're at the end of yourself, he's not done yet. He's not done yet. Go to verse 19 and it's really 19b, it's the second portion of 19. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days. And immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is indeed the son of God. Most likely his testimony and sharing what Christ has done for him. And because he knows the word so well, he's able to even preach too, because he's been trained in the scriptures. All who heard him were amazed isn't this the same man who caused such devastation among Jesus' followers in Jerusalem? They asked. And didn't he come here to arrest them and take them in chains to the leading priests? Saul's preaching became more and more powerful and the Jews in Damascus couldn't refute his proofs that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. Wow, this is amazing. I mean, he, he literally came to this place to fight believers of the way of Jesus Christ. And now he is defending the gospel. And now the Jews that knew him so well, they can't refute him. They can't stop him. The unbelievers can't, they can't handle his arguments for the gospel. Now, I just wanna let you know that verse 23 is, is interesting. It says, after a while, some of the Jews plotted together to kill him and they were watching for him day and night at the city gate so they could murder him. 
but Saul was told about their plot. So during the night, some of the other believers lowered him in a large basket through an opening in the city wall. There is belief, and, and um, Paul refers to this in Galatians 1, that he ran to Arabia for three years. And this is what we do. He said it himself, so we don't need to just believe this. We know it's true that Saul ran to Arabia for three years where Jesus himself taught him and, and helped him understand the gospel even more. You can read about that in Galatians 1. I wish I had time to cover all of it. In fact, uh, man, they talk about this conversion three times in the book of Acts or two more times in the book of Acts and then Galatians 1, he talks about it and it's just powerful. So for three years, Paul goes away to be trained up, but he also continues to minister in Arabia, which is to the right side of Damascus. So not too far from Damascus. Okay, then he meets the apostles later, all right? Now, verse 26 says, when Saul arrived in Jerusalem, so he actually goes to Arabia for three years, then he goes down to Jerusalem. So he left Damascus, goes all the way back to Jerusalem. And when Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers, but they were all afraid of him too. So the, the word, there was no social media. There was no Twitter feed. There was no breaking news alerts on your phones. Years later, people had not known that he had been changed yet. Okay, and not, not everyone trusted this yet. So once again, he's in a predicament where he needs an Ananias in his life to confirm his salvation. Okay, and it says they did not believe he had truly become a believer. Then Barnabas, also known as the encourager, brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. He also told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. Thank God for Barnabas is in our lives, right? So Saul stayed with the apostles and went all around Jerusalem with them, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. He debated with some Greek speaking Jews, but they tried to murder him. He's already seen how he has to suffer for Jesus. And when the believers heard about this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus, his hometown. Man, he's traveling everywhere right now. The reason why is because he is so effective, the devil and the opposing forces are trying to kill him already. But the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Just think about this for a moment, one more time. This man was on his way to send Christians to prison and possibly death if they were sentenced to death. And now he is in the same predicament. And he's preaching boldly and no one can refute him. God has changed this man. And God is using him, or not using in a negative way, but utilizing him. He's an instrument for the kingdom of God. A weapon, and I think. And by the way, what a lethal blow this was to the kingdom of darkness, wasn't it? To lose one of their soldiers. Verse 31, and it finishes our portion of scripture today. The church then had peace throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, and it became stronger as the believers lived in the fear of the Lord and with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it also grew in numbers. Peace and missional favor followed these days for three reasons. One, Saul was no longer a foe, but a friend <laughs> and an effective witness too. Number two, the people did not fear man, but faithfully worshiped and served the Lord. They feared the Lord. They honored him. They revered him. They worshiped him. They put Jesus first. And lastly, the Holy Spirit gave them courage and success in making disciples, evangelizing the lost. The Holy Spirit is there to encourage. Let me remind you what the word encourage means. It means to put courage into someone. Barnabas put courage into the believers that Saul had changed. The Holy Spirit is in your heart and your life as a believer to place courage in you. Why? Because your life is a testimony for other people to see the grace of Jesus Christ. And we're gonna need courage for that, amen? Let's talk about applying this to our life. Paul's conversion obviously is one of the most unique and powerful conversions in scripture because Jesus shows up 
and blinds him to get a hold of his attention and, and to change his heart and his mind. And in that humbling, he does convert. So what is conversion then? Because not everyone has the same kind of conversion, right? Not many of us were blinded in here on a road somewhere, but maybe God got a hold of you somehow drastically or through some messenger or something like that. Conversion is a spiritual change of the heart and direction in life. Conversion is a turning from a life of sin and unbelief, which is repentance, to placing faith in Christ for salvation. And following conversion is a noticeable lifestyle change from the previous lifestyle. You can tell, in other words, that someone has been converted. We can tell that Saul was converted, that he believed in Jesus Christ, that he repented of his sin because everything changed from that day forward. Paul himself says this in the book of Acts, uh, verse 26, nine through 11, he says this, I used to believe that I ought to do everything I could to oppose the very name of Jesus, the Nazarene. Indeed, I did just that in Jerusalem. Authorized by the leading priest, I caused many believers there to be sent to prison and I cast my vote against them when they were condemned to death. Many times I had punished, I had punished in the synagogues to get them, I guess I messed, did a, a typo there. Many times I had them punished, sorry, in the synagogues to get them to curse Jesus. How about that? Wow. In other words, curse Jesus, turn from your faith, denounce your faith in Jesus. Ooh, wait, wait a minute. So Saul was trying to get people to curse Jesus and Jesus saves him? Wow, that's some grace right there. I was so violently opposed to them that I even chased them down in foreign cities and he refers to Damascus next. Galatians 1.13 says, you know what I was like when I followed the Jewish religion, how violently, how I violently persecuted God's church. I did my best to destroy it. This is Paul reflecting on how he was before Jesus. 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 17. This is a powerful example of a testimony. If you're ever trying to write your testimony, this is a great example of it. I thank God, or I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him. Even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ. In my insolence or ignorance, I persecuted his people, but God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with faith and love that came from Christ Jesus. This is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and I am the worst of them all. I titled this message, The Chief of Sinners Saved. He is the chief of sinners and Jesus saves him. Jesus shows him mercy but God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. And Paul does a little praise moment. He says, all honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God, amen. He starts praising the Lord. Paul did a 180 because of Jesus Christ. Let me just remind us here. Paul's conversion was like, for a lack of better example here, maybe he went from being a hard rock to a sponge receptive to the Lord, willing to soak in whatever Jesus commanded or said. Paul went from blaspheming Jesus to submitting and obeying him. Paul went from trying to silence teaching about Jesus to being a prolific preacher for the gospel of Jesus. Paul went from persecuting Christians to suffering for Christ. Paul's attitude towards Jesus changed. Paul's posture towards sin changed. His view of the scriptures changed. His purpose in life changed. Paul was eager to serve the Lord, to make the gospel known, to tell the truth to people he used to run with. Paul's conversion gives us a great example, doesn't it? 
of how you can tell someone has been saved and transformed by the gospel. And maybe it's because it's such a stark change that we can tell. I think about that as a pastor of a church, born and raised in the church. Anyone know what I'm talking about? You've been a Christian your whole life. You can kind of forget your change, can't you? Do you recall, and this goes for all of us, not just those of us who've been raised in the church. And by the way, when, when we say that, this is what we really mean. We mean raised in Jesus. Because our faith is not in church. Our faith is in Jesus Christ. Okay. And let's make sure we help clarify that so we don't confuse people. Well, I, don't, I never went to church. I, I want you to get with Jesus more than anything. Not just attend church. Church doesn't save you, Jesus saves you. All right, now can you meet Jesus at church? Amen, hallelujah, yes you can. Hopefully even today, okay? But do you recall your posture towards sin? Do you recall your posture towards God, the Bible, the church? What about your purpose in life since your conversion? Do you remember your conversion? Just take a moment to think about that. Do you remember when your life changed? Do you remember what you used to be like and how God's changed you and now, now you're a new way, you have a new heart, new attitude, new way of living? Has your outlook on life changed? And what do you do with your time? Remember that? Maybe now you spend time reading the word or going to church and serving. Beforehand, you didn't. Maybe you could care less about the Bible. Maybe you could care less about living holy. And then ever since you met Jesus, you want to honor him and obey him. You know what I'm talking about? That's conversion. You've been changed. I've had people say, I, I, I feel, man, there's so many different conversations I had about this but they'll, they'll express some form of conviction for not doing something right for the Lord. Now there's two pro- approaches to that. One, it could be religion and legalism, or it could be a genuine heart to wanna to obey God. And so I process that with people. But most of the time when someone feels bad that they're not doing something for the Lord, usually that's a good sign that the Holy Spirit is in their life. So they're saved. But sometimes they've been raised in religion, so they think they have to do things to be saved. That is wrong. You don't do anything to be saved. Jesus did everything so you could be saved on the cross. Okay? The reason why I love to read the word, I love to be at church, I love to serve, is because of what he did for me, not what I did. It's what he did. Just hope that we can grasp that today. For us who have been saved for quite some time, there is a love for God that matures and grows up, isn't there? But I will say this, let us be careful that we remain grateful for his grace, amen? That's why we take communion too, every once in a while, just to remember, soften our hearts, keep them soft. Let us be careful not to get so comfortable in apathy. This, is, this might hurt a little bit today, okay? But apathy and, and not being concerned for the things of the Lord is dangerous to the church. We need to be careful that we don't get comfortable in the grace of Jesus Christ. We need to remember, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus laid down his life for us. We should give our lives for him and for everyone around us to know Jesus Christ. That's why Pastor Ryan calls you to evangelism That's why I ask you to take Bibles and share them. It helps you follow Jesus. It's impossible to get comfortable if we're truly following Jesus. I don't think the disciples ever got comfortable again after they started following Jesus. Now, I don't mean that there's not rest. Please don't take my words wrong. There is rest in Jesus Christ. No longer working for your salvation, knowing that you're forgiven and saved to have eternal life. There is spiritual comfort and rest in your heart, but the Lord has called us to do work here on earth while we're here. Let us not get so comfortable that we forget that. Let me now turn to our last and final points. Paul's conversion teaches us that God loves you. I, <laughs> this is gonna be funny, okay, a little funny. 
God loves you when you're resisting his word and love like a stubborn mule. Yes, I put that in there. I put that in there. Like a stubborn mule. We kick against the goads. We fight against Jesus. We fight against God. We even fight against our Christian parents or our Christian brothers or sisters. Those, those parents in our life that are praying for us and working hard and grandparents that are always praying, always inviting us. We kick against them. We do. Don't be a stubborn mule. Surrender. Humble yourself. If you hear the Lord calling you home today, let him in. If he's at the heart, your heart knocking on the door, let him in. He wants to save you. He wants to spend his life with you. He wants to change your life. Someone once said, the worst sinners often make the best saints. That may be true, but I think in God's eyes, there's no favoritism. But I tell you, if Saul, man, wow. He, arguably 12 to 13, they, I'm being technical here, but 13 books of the New Testament, Hebrews is debated whether it was Paul or not. 13 books of the New Testament. God used him that much. I've also heard it said that God's been called the hound of heaven. He will find you. I don't know, that sounds a little odd to call God a hound. But he is going to find you on those roads because he loves you. Secondly, God's grace is more powerful than the hardest of hearts. So church, do not lose hope or faith in God to save those who you are praying for. I believe God isn't done saving Saul's in our lifetime. Be ready because you could be the next Ananias or Barnabas. You could. Thirdly, despite our past, salvation in Christ offers new life and new purpose. If you've lived a, a life of sin and you've never believed in Jesus Christ, he doesn't just want to save you. He wants to change your destiny and your purpose and what you do here on earth. And for us as Christians, he saved us so that we would have a new purpose as well. He saved us from sin and saved us for his purposes. I love what Paul said about his own life. Philippians 3.12, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I press on, I keep pursuing, in other words, to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Ultimately, he was called to be the minister to the Gentiles and everyone he would come encounter with. But the question is for you is, why did Jesus save you? Maybe you still ask, why me? And that you may be saying that in a humble heart. I can't believe you saved me, Jesus. Why me? There's a reason he saves you. One, he loves you. He doesn't want you to go to hell. But two, he has a plan and purpose for your life here on earth as well. Why did he take a hold of you? I would encourage you not just to seek the help of the Holy Spirit, but to also seek what is God's plan for me right now? Here's the general one for all of us. Obviously go and make disciples, go and reach the lost. And Paul said this, 1 Timothy 1, 16, I'm gonna re read it again but God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. He has saved you to be an example of his grace so that now even more people could be saved. Mm -hmm. And let's not underestimate our testimony, okay? Why don't we stand together and let's pray. I'm gonna be bold and just say, if you need prayer for salvation today, you've been maybe running, fighting. You're online, maybe watching right now. Maybe you're in this place. Our prayer team is gonna come up at the end. We wanna take time to pray with you. If you need to surrender your life to Jesus and quit fighting and give him your heart, your faith, I'm gonna encourage you to do that. He loves you. You've heard the gospel a couple of times today. 
through the communion and through this sermon, he died for you because you couldn't save yourself. He died because of our sin. There was no way we could ever make ourselves holy enough to be forgiven and to go to heaven. So Jesus gave his life to cover you with his righteousness so that when you stand before God, he says, you are my son, you are my daughter, welcome home. That is the only reason why we get into heaven is because Jesus covers over us and we are declared righteous in God's sight. He imputes or applies his righteousness on us so that when he, God sees us on judgment day, we are righteous and we have everlasting life. It's nothing you do. The only thing we possibly can in any way, shape or form is receive this gift or deny it. And people do deny and people don't receive. And I wanna encourage you today to give your heart to Jesus. And if you do, we have materials and everything to help you with this journey. And so there's a card in your pew or even our team up here, they have those, the prayer team, they're ready to pray with you. And I also just want us as Christians to pray for those. So anyone that you have maybe even just an inkling of you know, despair about and you, you're like, there's just, you know, I've actually thought that God can't save that person. I wanna counter that thought and pray for them today. Amen? I wanna get rid of that doubt and have faith that he can change their hearts, amen? It's Jesus. All we gotta do is do the prayer. Let, let God do the heart work, okay? So whoever that is, and even those who are on the cusp, who are almost ready, let's pray for them before we close. All right, let's do this together, okay? Lord, we come to you. And first of all, we are so grateful for our salvation. We're grateful, Lord, for our conversion. And Lord, it's not fake, it's real. You've changed my life, our lives. We're no longer the person we used to be and we're still growing and becoming more like Jesus. Thank you, God, for your patience and grace for us as we are imperfect, trying to be more like Christ. Lord, we think about those people who we would just kind of judge the book by its cover and think they can't be changed. God, forgive us for that, first of all. Lord, forgive us for any doubt. Lord, for, for maybe being just tired and have lost endurance praying for them. Lord, we renew our prayers again and our faith again. And God, we ask that you would melt the cold hearts. Lord, we pray that when we cast seeds or the seeds that have already been planted, the seed of the gospel, the good news that's, that may already be there sitting on a hard heart. God, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would send your rains to soften their hearts, that you would send grace, that you would send messengers, that you would send things to get their attention that would break the hard follow ground and it would soften it so your gospel would sink in so that Jesus would be received. Lord, may your Holy Spirit go before us and convict and convince them that they need Jesus to save them from their sin. Convince them that they are lost and a sinner in need of salvation and that Jesus is the only one that can save them. God, we've been praying for so long and I can think of some of the names and the people I've prayed for with these families in this room. And God, we ask for deliverance for salvation in Jesus' name. And Lord, it can't be by our might or power, it must be by your spirit. So Lord, we're also gonna surrender trying too hard. We're gonna surrender our, our attempts that are feeble and impossible. We need your spirit to do it. God, forgive us for trying to force faith into people. Forgive us for trying to force a heart change. Only you can change the heart of man. So God, we pull back to pray, which is the greater work than anything we can do. And Lord, as you lead us by your spirit to share what Jesus has done, we can do that too. We can pray and we can tell people about the love of Jesus Christ for them. So Lord, lead us for the timing on that and the way, or Lord, let it be that through Easter Sunday or through the love we're gonna show on 
Saturday for our Easter fest or Friday night worship night. Maybe it's that moment, God, where you change their hearts. And Lord, it's nothing that we've done except maybe an invite or maybe a cup of coffee or sitting down and just hanging out. Lord, use your love through us, Lord, to soften the hard ground. Lord, send your reins, whatever that may be, to soften hearts. God, encourage us as believers to not give up. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us, God, you can change any hearts today and for changing ours. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen.